Hello. Good. Good afternoon. I know this is post lunch and the, you know, possibly the fourth session after lunch and you guys are about to drop dead without that chai and we are standing right between you. But you know, there used to be a very famous song, uh, Raj Kapoor ka, uh, long time ago, which used to say, Mera juta hai Japani, ye patloon English tani, sar pe lal topi rusi, fir bhi dil hai Hindustani. Now the point is, these days it's not enough to only have dil hai Hindustani, hai na? So we have to have a lot more stuff that is Hindustani, including, suppose in Bollywood movies, they used to say, Ram Singh, mera banduk lao, right? Now, what happens if that banduk is actually coming from Rus and the bullets are coming from somewhere else? These days, of course, most of the banduks are coming from China and the bullets from Pakistan, but that's a different issue, right? Local defense manufacturing. How do you make sure that the banduk and the bullets and the missiles and the planes and everything, most of it at least, is made here in India? What needs to be done? We don't have much time. Let's get into it. Arjun, you are the consultant. Let's start off. Give us a 360 view of where we are, what we need to do. Yeah, thanks, Alokesh. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. I'm extremely humbled to share this dais uh, along with this uh, esteemed coal panelist, and especially Jain, sir. I think I've been a great fan of you. I've been following you as well. Uh, so, so really delighted to be a part of it. So I just want to get some kind of introduction to myself apart from being a partner. I thought I'll just share this thing with you that uh, I belong to a proud family which has been last two generations servicing the government of India. Uh, my grandfather moved as a civil defense uh, servant and my father has retired as a joint secretary from RAW who was leading the technology wing which contributes about 94% of the intelligence of, of what India could gather from, right? So, and obviously my, uh, my father's brother was in uh, civil defense. He was a pilot, fighter pilot. So therefore I do understand and this is something which has been uh, having a conversation like a family That's conversation. That's why I was thinking through. why you look like a fighter pilot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so so I, th I think obviously while we were talking about all these things, what was uh, important is that despite all these things, I've landed up into a consulting space and could not be there. But today, with all these things opening up, it does give us an opportunity to still you know, contribute back to, the, uh, to somewhere the national interest of, the, of, of, the, of, of our nation. So I was really delighted to be a part of this and have a conversation as well. So I think coming to this topic, right, uh, what I'll do is that I'll cover th about the kind of positives about what has happened, development which has happened in the government policies, uh, what was the market trends, and probably capture all of this. I've taken a note of that so that I don't miss it out. And largely talk about the fact that why is the sentiment so positive and cover that part and then obviously we leave it to the more specialists to talk in more detail about that particular part, right? So with that particular context, what has been the potential challenges in the past, right? Largely if I look at the recent developments of what's happening, I think there is a, there is a pressure in terms of balancing out your eastern part of the world and western part of the world in terms of how we do a trading, how we do an import and obviously we've been traditionally an importer from, from Russia and obviously some parts of it from, from the Western world, but obviously with changing equations of what's happening with Russia, China, and other developments, and we wanting to maintain a neutral position, right? it becomes important that we are more self-sustained in that particular part of it. The second is obviously we are always under a threat, uh, not only threat from our, our, our popular neighbors, but we are also under a threat across uh, other regions and geographies as well, and therefore that necessitate for us to ensure that we are constantly modernizing our our defense uh, artillery, def defense equipments and platforms as well. And that, and that is an important part of it that we are able to modernize that, which essentially means that I should be having an IP which I hold and I should have a technology which is transferred to me so that I can, I can react faster as well. My quality of testing has to be much more faster. My equipment should be ready for the war at any point in given time. And obviously all these things requires a good strong supply chain resilience. We've seen it in the recent past of COVID, we've seen it in the recent past of what we're seeing with respect to what happened with Ukraine and Russia, that there would always be potential scenarios of risk where the parts are not available with us or the companies are not available with us and therefore we can get into a risk of not being ready as well. In fact, there could be scenarios where your supplier is your key or, or the downlink supplier or the downstream suppliers are the ones who are actually key people who are, at, who are actually your potentially enemy coming from the other countries as well, right? So those are the kind of risks that we we're dealing with, apart from the challenges of what government is facing, especially around the delays in terms of running of the contracts. Now with these challenges, I think government has done some good initiative, taken certain good initiatives in terms of the policies that they have come out with. 
and those initiatives are kind of giving us the fruits and, and pushing this impetus to, to get a better growth in the industry of aviation and, and defense as well. And I'll probably quote some of it and then leave it uh, to the rest of the panelists to talk in detail about that. So one is obviously uh, the initiative around substantial changes that they've done in terms of defense acquisition procurement, DAP 2020, right? So they have uh, managed to offset the contract, uh, uh, con uh, managed to get the offset contract thresholds from 36 million USD to 240 million USD. They've simplified the process to make the contract happen in 22 weeks, which used to take about 76 weeks in the past as well. Obviously, still a wrong way to go, but we are touching that particular numbers as well. Now, when it comes to uh, in encouraging more internalization and, and manufacturing internally, one of the key factors is your positive indigenization list, right? under which we have embargoed about 509 defense platforms. 4,666 components has been embargoed under them, which essentially means it opens up opportunities for our own local manufacturers to step in over there. Right? There is also, as I was talking about holding the IP and getting the technology to be owned, there is also 23 lease agreements for transfer of technology which has been signed up in the recent past. There are about 316, 369 companies which has been participated as a part of six, 606 industry licenses, right? And these are all initiative which has recently taken place. What it does, it has started to give us at least a defense production value of $14 billion in the FI23, and I'm sure it's going to probably go up at a much more faster rate in years to come as well, right? The other thing which has happened is that your FDI, right? Your FDI has gone up from 49% to 74%, right? Along with that, what they've also ensured is that there's a plowback on the vendors to 30% of it to contribute back to the society as well, which is where, uh, which, which benefit uh, the local players as well, especially, especially the SMS, SMS, SMSE as well as the, the local, what you call as uh, the job opportunities over there as well. If you look at the impact of that, right, there is $13.2 billion of offset obligation which is, needs to be discharged in 20, uh, 2031, right. There are also initiatives that our, co uh, our panelists in the previous session talked about, which is the IDEX, right? Under IDEX, there are about 60 million US dollars investment which has been done, which is supposed to be allocated for the purpose of the startups as well, right? Now, in order to make the ease of manufacturing or ease of doing businesses here, we've seen they've taken a lot of initiative in terms of at least two states, and uh, we've created what you call as a defense uh, industries corridor in the UP as well as in Tamil Nadu. And obviously there is also... Okay, there is already Arjun, investment you need to really hurry up on yeah. that. Yeah. Let's get the others in. No problem. So, hmm. so UP is about $3.1 million and uh, Tamil Nadu is about $2.33 million. So all in all, I think there are a lot of development and a lot of policy which has been put in place for us to grow at a much more faster rate in this particular industry as well. Right, right. Lots of numbers, man. <laughs> really, yeah, but they're all good numbers, huh? But see, before I, you know, uh, because of this paucity of time, we really cannot get into a really big kind of discussion around strategy and all that, which I wanted to do. But instead, we'll focus on, you know, if we are going to do defense production increase in India, the target is about three billion, uh, what, three lakh crore by 28-29. Isn't that right? How can we do that without developing our own IP systems, right? The intellectual technologies, uh, intellectual properties is what we had uh, also chatted about the other day. So, Patil sir and Ankit, uh, your views on developing, you know, our own IPs. I think this is a movement which uh, actually began long back. And uh, it's exactly a decade back, although uh, defense manufacturing that we opened up about 22 years back, 2002. One decade back, 2014, came a time when some of those policy initiatives actually led to creation of what was, or what is today known as IDDM, hmm. Indigenously Designed, Developed and Manufactured. And I must tell you, in exactly eight years from 2016 to now, nearly 92% of future acquisition sits in the IDDM. So it's not something of the future. Okay. It's a capability which the industry today has developed. It can offer things indigenously. So the one other day is what you said about the, the rifle being from one place, <laughs> the ammunition from another. <laughs> so that those are things of the past. In, in fact, there are uh, today out of the 509 items which uh, were just about talked about, a lot of these actually appear in what is called the 
positive indigenization list, it's a change of word. Right. First list called it negative import list. The yes. name was then changed to positive indigenization. So essentially, the ability of Indian industry today to fundamentally conceptualize from technology to a product, to a system, to a full-fledged platform is well recognized. And that's where the future acquisition. You said it right, roughly about between 3 and 4 lakh crores is a target of 29. Today we are somewhere close to about 1.7 lakh crores of actual capital acquisition and this number will more than double and that's where these numbers are. Now out of this, 1.1 is today produced in the country. So things have changed. Okay. From, from 1.1 lakh crores getting produced in the Indian industry, in addition, there is a target for year after next of 25,000 crores of export. That's an add-on and that's an additional indigenization or indigenous production that's happening. Current year, another two days, today and tomorrow, we hope to be seeing 20,000 crores of exports behind us. Last yeah. year was 16, this year 20. Next year, probably a little more. And March 26, we will see somewhere closer to between 25 and 30,000. So that's essentially where the capability of industry is now actually visible. Correct. The percentages, of course, are changing. Private public ratio is dramatically improving from what it used to be earlier. Correct. In fact, in exports, India is now among the top 25 in the world in terms of exports. We joined, right? we joined when we were about 11,000 crores. Ten, between 10 and 11, we were 23rd. This year, when CIPRI data comes, we'll know. About six months later, we'll know. We mm. probably will be better than 20, for sure. Better than 20, not now. bad. Yeah. Yeah. We are going good. to 16, yeah. if we get that. Right. More like 16. Ankit, you've been smiling all along. Tell us <laughs> what makes you happy about the defense sector. You know, there was, I think, a one lakh crore kind of uh, corpus announced by the FM in the interim budget, right, for uh, tech, deep tech and all kind of work, and you are, you are in that area, right? Uh, so tell us about your views on IP and how this kind of funding from the government might help. No, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, in our opinion, and this is something that at Idea Forge we've been pursuing for the very, from the very beginning, is that, um, India should have the ability to make the world's best and the world's first in any domain that we can think of in defense. And that is something which we have to sign up to and we have to try and lead with a lot of passion and vigor. And one of the biggest roadblocks to that over the years has been the fact that there was no capital available and many defense programs need a very long gestation period and a lot of capital to build fundamental technology that can can then be used as a bedrock for uh, much bigger and much uh, more complex uh, technologies. Uh, with the announcements that have happened, with the changes like Jen sir highlighted with respect to IDDM, the entire emergency procurement process, the IDEX uh, process and many other programs that have come to shape in the last few years, it is genuinely unleashing the bulls and it is encouraging everybody to come into the sector and it is very clear now that it's not going to be enough to just get a transfer of technology from somewhere else or merely do a build to print. I think that ambition of making in India is evolving very rapidly to made in India and to beyond that getting to design, develop and do everything from scratch in India. And I think it is extremely heartening to see that every conversation is about how deeper are we going into the value chain. And are we doing enough in our country to call our products our own products? And I think that is going to be important. But that ambition of doing world's first or the world's best is where we will unlock doing all of this with much higher value created in the country. Otherwise, value creation may become uh, very low and will lead to a place where we will end up still being dependent on other people for crucial and critical technology areas. Right. What else do you want to add something? I think uh, there's a little different dimension I have on what Tankit said. It's not about wanting to get any technology from anywhere else. If you today bring in any transfer of technology, one thing you are sure, 
the day you want to pull the trigger, your yes. weapon will not function. Yeah. And that's exactly what technology we know will do. And that's where it's not a matter of choice that you can get a TOT, you can get some hardware from overseas, build a system here, those days are gone. If we want a strategic autonomy, and that's exactly where the government is very clearly focused on, this strategic autonomy will come if you are master of your own destiny by creating the IP, the point that you started. You have to create IP, you have to create that essence which is getting in the intelligence that is getting built into the system. That has to be indigenous. Now, this takes me to building an intelligence not on the basis of any standard chips, because we, we know where the chips come from. And that's essentially where the chip becomes the first fundamental building block. And that is something which we have to still get completely indigenous. Till that point in time, all of us in the military domain would not buy a standard chip. We'll buy something which can simply solve mathematical logic and write entire software here. And that's the only way you can ensure that your user or your armed forces actually can sort of be guaranteed that when he wants to pull the trigger, his trigger functions and he fires. Right. And what about this, you know, developing a whole manufacturing ecosystem is easier said than done and it's not done overnight. It's going to take a long, long time, right? Arjun, uh, maybe you can quickly tell us about a little bit about the supply chain yeah. uh, challenges yeah. that we face. Yeah. So I just want to add, and the same, I think it continues to the same question you're trying to talk about, and I mentioned it, is basically supply chain resilience, right? That's the important part. And I think Sir talked about chip, right? And that start, that starts, that's the starting point itself, right? Unless I build my own internal ecosystem, my supply chain resilience will not come in. So which is where I think we need to have enough people contributing from India itself and own that particular IP that we are talking about, right? In my view, when you're talking about supply chain, it is not only a supply chain of materials, it is also the entire value chain. And when I'm saying value chain in our, especially for a defense, most important value chain is one, the R&D and your ability to invest on that on a constant basis, that's number one. And there has to be a separate team of people who are gonna do that, may not be necessarily the same people of manufacturing as well, because assembly becomes equally important. So one is the assembly and the capability to scale, because that's equally important, as much important as when you're talking about R&D, right? So those are two different skills and both have to be built. The second part is your ability to test, because whenever you're talking about these equipments, they're not normal equipment. Even for an automotive company, they talk about a particular perfection of 99.999. Imagine you're talking about defense, right? When you talk about that particular part of the defense, then your testing, your capability to do a quality assurance, quality testing has to be top class. And that requires a different, again, set of skills, people, capability, and st augmentation in terms of even infrastructure to kind of stimulate that particular part, right? Many of these things would be working with simulations. It may not be working without a simulation in place, right? I cannot probably simulate in warfare. But if I have to do that today, I need to have an infrastructure which can support me in that particular simulation today. And therefore, that becomes a much more bigger opportunity for us to work on. Then obviously, the manpower part of it and ensuring that the skills which are needed for us to to invest on this may not be existing in India for the time being, but we'll have to figure out that how does this particular part of the value chain works as well. Right. And in, you know, uh, Ankit's company, Idea Forge, makes drones. It's one of the top companies in the world that makes drones for a startup in India. That's a really big deal. So give a special round of applause to Ankit and Idea Forge for the kind of work. And of course, LNT is a powerhouse on, in its own right. <laughs> you know, you don't need the plaudits, you already have hundreds of them. But Ankit, between civilian and defense, what is your revenue split? So our split right now is uh, definitely very heavily skewed towards defense. Uh, particularly, like I mentioned, what happened and is happening in the fast track procurement cases. Uh, we are trying to fill the deficit we created uh, by not investing in it early enough. Right. So I think there is a massive pace of induction that is uh, expected and is happening in the defense side. So it will remain heavy. It is almost, uh, I think, 90% defense as of last quarter. How much? 90% defense 90 as of defense. last quarter. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is going to remain heavy on that side, but we are seeing that the new policy, the mm -hmm. way the market is opening up on defense, we are able to explore new applications. It is going to grow in parallel, and it's going to become substantial, but uh, obviously it will remain heavy on the defense side in the short term, given the deficit we are trying to fill and it's heartening to see that 
it's not just deficit of a specific kinds that is being filled. Uh, we are exploring many large segments uh, within the industry and all of these segments are going to grow. What will be required is to take the technology to its full scale in the armed forces because when yeah. it comes to war, uh, this is not going to be the end of where the technology depth will have to be uh, showing up. Like mm. When you go to war, we'll have to have this technology depth penetrated at the full scale. So, Patil sir, you know the, the fact about manufacturing in defense and private companies getting into defense, not just getting in but like now hundreds of companies are doing it and you uh, and LNT have been, you know, uh, there for a very long time along with Mahindra and some others. What is the balance, how do you maintain a balance between profitability and uh, the need to, especially considering that you have practically one customer, right, which is the government of India, apart from the export side. So, how do you maintain this balance between business sense and, uh, you know, doing the right thing in defense? I think uh, where some of us made a difference, and that's why we are the market leader, at least in private sector, was uh, 18 years before the defense sector was opened, we invested. You? We invested for those 18 years in R&D. Okay. So, having done that, obviously when the markets opened, I remember little more than two decades back, there were not more than two large companies and probably not more than five to six hundred small entrepreneurs who were in defense. Today, if I have to count, there are about ten real large players. I'm talking again of private sector. And there are 12,000 MSMEs. 12,000? The number speaks as to what has really happened to this sector. The numbers, again, from typically 30,000 crores of production happening in India, today is quadrupled. And right. going forward, we are going to be seeing this further two and a half times higher, exactly in the next five years. Now, that's the kind of a scale today is offering. The kind of geopolitics which we are in, we are no longer, most of our armed forces talk of two-front war. To my mind, we are in four-front war, not two-front. Okay. We are on the two land borders. Yeah. We have the eastern side of the sea to be guarded, and mm -hmm. we have the current trouble, which is whatever is going on, right from the Middle East to the North Sea. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of those areas, and that's where you see last week's, rather this week's news release said, Indian Navy actually having put 23 warships and 11 submarines. You never heard of it in the past. Right. Now, that's the scale at which India today is contributing to maintain peace, guarantee everybody a safe navigation through the Indian Ocean. And yeah. I think this is precisely what is drawing enormously on what India is trying to do. And obviously, it's become an expectation of the world authorities and the world powers, all the top few, that this is a role which India will have to play if we have to actually guarantee safe navigation. And this is essentially where I see lots of investment is actually going to be getting into this sector. Today we see it's typically about little more than five, six times in terms of growth already. Okay. And more and more we are capturing it within India rather than it going out. Imagine 1.7 lakhs crore, 1.1 already here, 20,000 crore of exports is 1.3, the number which my colleague talked about as 14 billion dollars. Now, this is a number which obviously will grow at a much, much, much higher CAGR. Government wanted to do 15% CAGR year on year. It's a stated policy. They've yeah. not been able to spend. It's not a money availability. And I, I hear it every time and very carefully. It's not availability of money. Money will be available if armed forces were able to spend. And that's exactly where the industry remains in that sense, its ability of the industry to do more and more will come. Supply side. Right. Supply Thank you side. very much. Absolutely rightly spoken. We have run out of time. Unfortunately, we can't uh, take any more questions, but only one point I would like to just conclude this uh, discussion on is that, you know, the finance minister will talk today on the road to Vixit Bharat at 2047 and to be a developed country, you have to be both economically and militarily there. 
right? So hopefully with companies like yours and with consultants like yours and with lots of thinking and expert thinking, we will surely get there. Thank you very much to all the panelists. Thank you.